I'm Ewa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Port Over. And Jill Lepore, I've been waiting to have this conversation with Jill Lepore for a bit. Uh, you know her from These Truths, This America. She's been a finalist for the Pulitzer, a finalist for the National Book Award, and also winner of the Bancroft for a book that came out a minute ago called The Name of War. But we may or may not get all the way back into your deep catalog. But Jill, thank you so much for joining us. The deadline is just out. And it's 10 years worth of essays. It's a small selection of 10 mm-hmm. years worth of essays. I think it's pretty great. I mean, I have to say, I didn't realize quite how closely I've been reading you in The New Yorker until mm-hmm. I started reading the deadline. I was like, oh, wait, this was chill. <laughs> mm-hmm. You have such a wide range of material in this book, though. And I mean, obviously, some of the things that people have read, like if then start the essay that started that book is in here. It's kind of cool to see the starts of all of these different books. And they, and you mentioned it too, there are little bits and bobs that have appeared mm-hmm. in these truths, but really this is its own work. And I'm wondering if we could talk about how it started for you, because again, 10 years, not the complete body of work for 10 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, hello. It's really fun to get a chance to speak with you. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, it was an interesting thing to try to figure out what to do for a book of essays because I write about so many different things. And I sometimes think it's a little bit like my mother used to say, it's like telling a woman she has a nice personality when you compliment a writer on how prolific she is. It's like, wait, but does that mean I'm good? <laughs> like, yes, I write a lot. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's not a virtue in its own right. Um, I am also willing to write about absolutely anything. Like if I get an assignment, I'm very unlikely to turn it down, partly because I just cannot imagine saying no, but, um, you know, to the chance to to, to write write about something. But also, it's, I'm curious about most things. So, so when I was asked to put together a collection of essays, I decided to limit it to just the last 10 years, partly because it's been such an exceptional Ferris wheel of American history. <laughs> um, Roller coaster doesn't even really get it because it's yeah. even sort of more inane than that. So I wanted to think about the political pieces over the last years that would contain the pandemic and would contain the Trump era. And so we'd have a kind of real time me trying to make sense of these unprecedented times as a historian. But then I also wanted to do something unusual for me, which was to gather together more personal pieces, which I quite infrequently write. Um, and I'd never put those in a book before. But in fact, the the title essay, the deadline is a personal essay. And so I really brought that material to the fore in that sense. It kind of mm-hmm. comes early in the collection as well. And I think for me, as a writer who has run screaming from the personal essay as a form for my entire adult career, not that I had kid career. But that was a, a big step to be willing to even, you know, see those between the pages of a book. Honestly, I was a little surprised to see it. And I like the way the collection, the deadline is organized. And it feels like you start with the deeply personal and you move into sort of where we are now as people. And I'm just wondering too, like, when you sat down to put all of these essays into one volume, are you thinking about that sort of arc as you're doing it? Or you're just thinking, well, this is a great piece and I'll find the place for it in the book because it really flows and not every collection is designed to flow like that. Oh, well, that's that's really nice to hear. Thank you. A friend of mine once said to me in a kind of brutal honesty that you get from friends that she thought that my aversion to the personal essay was fundamentally misogynistic, (laughs) that I really don't like reading personal essays And what I don't like about them is I don't like how many female intellectuals have been pressed into the service of the personal essay and thereby lost their intellectual authority, Mm -hmm. which is not a loss that men suffer when they occasionally write a personal essay. But you expose your underside, your soft belly, and it's sort of over for you as someone who's a serious thinker. I observed that from, you know, my very first years as a college student, and it really mm-hmm. distressed me. So I, it's not really a form that I have a lot of affection for, but I also have a kind of strong aversion to because of the way that it sorts writers into categories. 
in my field, I mean, I'm principally an American historian, all of the big selling big books are big books by men about men, you know, some guy writing a new biography of Andrew Jackson kind Mm -hmm. of thing, Walter Isaacson writing the new biography of Elon Musk, right? Women are not primarily the readers of those books. They're not the subjects or the authors of those books. And I, as a historian, have been trying to think differently about what I can bring to the publishing world and the world of letters, I guess it Mm -hmm. used to be called. As a historian and as an intellectual, that's different, but also wanting to reach readers. So I've really backed away from the personal essay for a long time. And when this friend said to me, she thought this was in a deep way kind of misogynist, we really wondered Mm -hmm. about that, whether I had belittled a form that happens to be dominated by women writers out of basic prejudice. So so part of starting this collection of essays with a few personal essays and ending up with, you know, the global pandemic and Trumpism and the insurrection and the sort of dismantling of, of American constitutional democracy was trying to battle a little bit against what I think of as a kind of artificial divide between those genres that historians will always deny that the personal affects how they think about the past. And, you know, that was a really important intervention of mid 20th century feminism that the personal is political and the past is also personal. So I think that's maybe what I was trying to do there. I think more though, I'm giving you a fancy answer for what was just maybe kind of a really practical no, the set of decisions. I think so. Part of what I'm trying to get to a little bit is this idea that here you are, a historian, writing about all of these different pieces that come together to tell the American story, right? Whether you're writing about the legal pieces or the profiles of writers. I mean, I kind of feel like we're living in a Frankenstein moment completely. So the idea that you're writing about the Frankenstein monster, right? And that's one of the mm-hmm. pieces that made you a finalist for the Pulitzer. I just think all of these different essays come together to deliver a portrait of where we are now. Mm-hmm. And I think it's kind of fascinating, given that you're a historian, right? Like the idea that you're sitting in this very current moment. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, the piece about your dad's college library and what he was reading and everything else, it's just, it's a great piece. It's never been published anywhere else. And it kind of fits perfectly, but I feel like I've got a really good idea of who your dad is. But I also have a little bit of a better idea of who you are. Like you've been clear Mm -hmm. in other interviews where you're like, well, I never planned on studying history. Mm -hmm. You started as a math major, then you become an English major. Then you come to history later via American studies, Mm -hmm. which, I mean, this track I don't have any degrees in history, and I feel yeah. often that I it's important to fess up to that. I don't actually think that's a problem. I think that historical writing and literary criticism and literary analysis mm-hmm. have changed considerably. You know, I was chair for many years at Harvard, where I teach of the history and literature program, which is right. a kind of combined undergraduate major. Mm-hmm. It takes the sensibilities of the new historicism and the linguistic turn yeah. in, in in the social sciences and brings them together. like, And that's been going on for a really long time. Mm-hmm. So from the vantage of academic inquiry, it makes perfect sense that I have English degrees and American studies degrees mm-hmm. and work in a history department. From the vantage point of what I do more broadly, I really do think of myself fundamentally as a writer. Yeah. Like I only ever wanted to be a writer. I just couldn't mm-hmm. figure out how to get anything published. So I went to graduate school because right. I needed health insurance. And then I ended up getting an academic job and I, <laughs> I still needed health insurance. So I've been incredibly blessed and fortunate Mm -hmm. to be able to have the chance to do the kind of teaching that I do and the kind of flexibility about what I teach and what I write that I have been incredibly lucky in that way. But but all of it from the very beginning was Mm -hmm. in the, um, you know, the service of trying to figure out how to spend most of my days reading and writing. Yeah, but that's all context, right? Like that's all context for the work that you've been doing, whether you're writing about Wonder Woman or Joe Gould. <laughs> Someone, a reader wrote, wrote a letter to the editor of the New Yorker saying, it was a sweet, it was, it was about a piece. I forget what piece it was about. It's like, I mm-hmm. never thought I was interested in this subject. And then I saw that Jill Laporte written about it. So I read the piece and I loved it. And I just want to say, I would really like it. if, Even if she would write an essay about the history of dirt, I would read it. And then I thought about that this spring because I wrote an essay about the history of 
seed catalogs, which is as close mm-hmm. to writing about dirt as I've ever come. Yeah. But that curiosity that gets us, you know, from Rachel Carson and Ruth Bader Ginsburg to data science, I mean, disruption, <laughs> like a word that maybe has lost all meaning at this point, I think possibly never quite meant what it was used to mean and leaves out the people piece of all of it you know, right? Technology is only as good as the people who program it, like AI, still driven by humans. All of this stuff, right? Like, it's a wild continuum, but yet it's just you being curious, figuring out how you get from what. How do you get an idea? I mean, it's not just stuff that you're assigned, though. I know you don't say no to assignments, but you're still the one who's turning in the work. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And I know I I have some... I try to be bold enough to say no here and there when I really mm-hmm. just really need to. Yeah. And often an assignment will be one thing and I will turn in something that's really very different. Right. But what I, one of the things that I love about it, and for me, thinking about the 10 years of American history that we all lived through, that these essays are in one fashion or another wrestling with, you know, I'm the one sort of sitting at home saying, geez, what's going to happen to society if we all live indoors? You know, and then I get an assignment. Could you write an essay about the the relationship of living indoors, att- yeah. living outdoors historically? Like, do people live indoors more? You know, here's some book. Like, that's just just an incredible gift to have yeah. the opportunity to just say, oh, well, I'll read these books. And then where do these books lead me? And where are the books that I led me from those books to these books lead? And mm-hmm. just kind of leapfrog across the stream of my own ignorance to try to get to the other side, a shore of some kind of knowledge about something where I could say something, especially the essays in this book, they really are a lot of things where like something was going on and I was asked to kind of write about it. And I was so grateful because I myself am mystified by what's going on. Like the disruptive, there's a, an essay in the book on the idea of disruptive innovation. Oh, it's 10 years ago now, maybe 2013, 2014. And I've been just so baffled by it. Like, I remember when I was asked to write some kind of a critic's piece about, uh, you know, the whole really tsunami of books and the cultural impetus behind this kind of cult of disruptive innovation. And I remember Mm -hmm. writing to my editor and saying, I mean, I I could, but how could anybody take this stuff seriously? Like, it actually, it just empirically is obviously wrong. Like, like it doesn't take more of a glancing investigation of it to see that it's it's, it's a belief system. That's, you know, just founded on really, really bad understanding of how change happens from anything that, you know, any historical inquiry or historical method has ever been able to demonstrate or theorize. And the editor was like, I think we need a little spend a little more time on it because people take it very seriously. Like a lot of people take this very seriously. And I was really, I was really surprised by that. And it was an essay that got a really overwhelming reaction, a polarized reaction. Mm-hmm. Um, But that was in scale with how deeply people were invested either for or against this idea, which was fascinating to me. And I think some of that, to be to be candid, some of the curiosity comes from my own seclusion. I mean, I'm essentially a hermit. Right. So and I'm really not online. Like I'm I'm very like in touch with my students. Like that's a lot of, you know, chat. That's a lot of hanging out with young people. So I have like it's not like I'm, but I'm not like on a like a tube floating along the river of the social media, you know, like this is my back. <laughs> just like, wow, look at the sun, which is how I kind of like a lot of stuff you read on, you know, that's like a take on something that's happened. Is just like, wait, didn't nine million people just say that 20 seconds ago? I don't ha- I'm just removed from that, which is in many ways totally irresponsible. But it it's a in most ways for me also utterly essential but it means that things like disruptive innovation like i didn't i wasn't <laughs> entirely hip to like this was you know this was the little stream that everybody's little inner tube was floating along i didn't know that so i was sort of like where do you people think you're going like this is this is like a waterfall right there that kind of thing is is really fun so it's just it's really nice to get like the you know the little the little ping of email that says hey have you thought about this at all because wondering what you make of that Mm -hmm. and I hadn't thought about it and I'm and I'm fascinated to know that people are thinking about it and I wonder what they're thinking about it and then 
it's a, just a joy to try to make sense of it and write something that could maybe be meaningful. But it seems to me that you always start with the people, right? Even if it's Bren, Ben Franklin's sister, right? That piece that started that book. Ben Franklin's sister, who does not have the vaulted, you know, vaunted life that her, <laughs> her brother has. Oof, that was that was a bit rough. But we've got her. We've got a lot about, let's call it organizations for the moment, right? Whether it's school or government or, you know, all of these big situational systems, I guess is a better phrase for it, systems. And yet you never lose sight of the people. And I kind of love that because, I mean, it seems to me that it would be very easy to fall in love with ideas, right? Like, Mm -hmm. how did we get from point A to point B? Disruption, I mean, I'm giggling a little bit as you talk about disruption, but again, like it really does leave people out of the equation, right? Like it just leaves all kinds of folks out of the equation. And yet here we are trying to tell the story or here you are trying to tell the story of us as a culture, a community, a society, whatever word you want to use to describe us. And you're pretty good about leaning into, you know, the evidence, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's one of the things I appreciate Mm -hmm. about reading you is that you want the details. You Mm -hmm. want all of the details. And if Mm -hmm. you can get them into one article, great. Mm -hmm. Maybe sometimes it takes a couple, but it always starts with the people. Mm -hmm. And how do you find that though as a scholar? I mean, essentially you are I mean, you're an academic. How do you balance the humans and the systems? Yeah. I mean, one of the essays you mentioned that's in this collection is um, is about Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Mm-hmm. And the occasion for writing it was, it was must have been 2018, the 200th anniversary of the pub- publication right. of the first edition of Frankenstein. And there was a, you know, a whole bunch of new, some quite lovely annotated editions of the book. But one was notably by a group of people who are interested and concerned about artificial intelligence. and mm-hmm. so wanted to see Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as a kind of Oppenheimer style warning about the consequences of uh, technological change absent and ethical consideration. And that is from an idea vantage, one way to read Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's especially helpful, but the way that it troubles me as a reading of Frankenstein is that it's really just putting the past to use to a very particular use that, you know, these AI guys had, you know, let's use mm-hmm. Frankenstein this way. So when I agreed to read the, write the piece, I decided I really wanted to understand Mary Shelley better. And I didn't really understand much about Mary Shelley. I knew a lot about her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft. Like I give a regular lecture in a class that I teach about Mary Wollstonecraft. Like I knew what Mary Wollstonecraft, I didn't really know Mary Shelley, but I had a former PhD student who had written a dual biography of the two of them. And I read that. And then I hadn't realized that Mary Shelley had written a, a diary, essentially a literary journal. It's sort of a Barnes and Noble special. It's a list of basically the books that she read and her reactions to yeah. them. It's just a style of journal that, you know, the kind of Boswell mm-hmm. and people did this, right? Write down what books you read. I did this when I was a kid. When I was Mary Shelley's age, I kept a journal that was <laughs> what I read and what I thought about it. And it was completely pretentious in the way that hers was too. But she was pregnant yeah. <laughs> as a teenager and had the series of pregnancies and losses, losses of pregnancies, losses of her children. And it's in that context that I came to understand the significance of Frankenstein. And then it really bothered me that a book written about the betrayal and, or loss of, of a child comes to be put to, there are many uses you could put a book to, that's fine, mm-hmm. you could, they want to do. But the essay that I wrote about Shelley is really all about these miscarriages and what it what it meant to lose all these babies. And I don't think that it had really quite been done before and it felt really meaningful and important to me to really put Mary Shelley's writings, her private writings about those losses on the page, and then Mm. see the book, the novel as a story about many, 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 many things, but including grief. You know, the way we talk about history now, and whether that's literary history or sociopolitical or economic, whatever form history takes, right? Whatever story about the past we're telling, you know, readers bring their own experience to whatever it is they picked up. And, you know, writers, same thing. I just, I feel like there isn't really anyone else who could write the way you do about this range of subjects, because we're also talking about Barbie and Bratz and the intellectual property battle that happened there. So we've gone from 
like creating a new literary history of Frankenstein, right? Because that's essentially what you did to intellectual property. And, you know, obviously we're living in a Barbie world as we tape this. Wow, are we living in a Barbie world? But intellectual property, Hollywood's on strike right now. And a lot of it has to do with yeah, IP, yeah, right? And yeah. and the creation of IP and who holds IP. And, you know, this kind of goes back to disruption. It kind of goes back to who gets to tell the stories about the things, right? Barbies, Bratz, Valley of the Dolls. Yeah. I mean, I, I really love um, writing about the law and the history of the law, the rules by which we live. And that's been a real source of fascination for me and pleasure in the chance to explore. I once started writing this book that I promised myself that one day I'll go back to and finish about Dickens. But Dickens was obsessed with copyright because he made no money in the United States. So he came to the United States in 1842 to lobby for international copyright law. His reputation as the great poet of the poor, you know, this was after Oliver Twist and you know, he yep. celebrated for, you know, writing these vivid accounts of the suffering of, of, of the poor and having them be real characters in, in his tale with dignity. And then he goes, <laughs> he's just trying to get Congress to pass a law that will increase his income. I find the whole history of copyright really interesting, but it mm -hmm. in does intersect with so many live concerns in our day that have to do with also freedom of speech, what can be said, who can say it, who needs mm -hmm. to credit other people for saying things, uh, with what authority do you speak, with, on what evidence are your claims based. I have for several years taught a class on the history of evidence at the law school, and I'm, I'm, I'm just really interested in that. The, well, everybody loves a courtroom drama, but the Barbie versus Bratz series of lawsuits was just a really, really interesting set of cases because what, in part, what was litigated was the female form. Is the Bratz or is the Barbie enough of a distortion, differently, different kinds of distortions of the female form from each other to be original? <laughs> it's just like these are judges having this argument about these two, in my view, really contemptible toys, which are just sucking each other dry. <laughs> I just thought it was a great it was a great story. Completely fascinated me. But yeah, I love I love looking at these legal struggles, struggles with the law, which also just narratively is a, is always going to be a really a really really fun essay to write. There's a lot of pieces in this collection that are about other courtroom dramas. So Griswold v. Connecticut, yep. Oberfeld v. v. Hodges, the chain of reproductive rights and same sex marriage cases the chain of cases that get you from Roe to Dobbs. Um, I think that being able to situate contemporary, especially decisions of the federal judiciary in a longer historical context is, is useful and important because people are really, especially, you know, younger readers are really just baffled. Like what the hell is happening? What, you know, what is actually going on? I love saying, well, let me start with twelve fifteen and Magna Carta. Like, like I have the like the pedant's desire to let's go back to the beginning and figure out what is law, what is fundamental law, who gets to decide what the rules are and what the rules are that govern the government, but also try to do that in a way that meets the narrative standards of a lively literary general interest magazine. That's the sort of fun trick to solve for. So, are you always thinking about the reader? As you write, because I mean, again, writing about the law is not the simplest thing in the world to do in an engaging manner. There are plenty of people who write for legal journals. They do the heavy lifting that gets cited later on. But the kind of writing that you do isn't simple. It seems easy, but it's not simple. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I am a total, you know, journal article geek. Like I can read journal articles all day long. Like that's what I do. What I know about anything is a small subset of what people who spend their entire careers working right. on know. And the reason that I can get up to speed pretty quickly on a subject is because of the excellence of that, you know, of scholarly monographs and academic journal articles, um, which is often where I go trawling for stories and I'll come across something and say, oh, wow, in the midst of Fairly turgid, but fundamentally really interesting theoretical argument. There's a footnote to, you know, some actual human who once experienced some kind of suffering or um, uplift because of this large turgid thing that was going on. And then I can kind of reverse engineer the story from the evidence and then engage that 
I remember once, and I don't think this is in collection, but I remember once I was asked if I'd write an essay about the history of taxation because there were a few new books and mm -hmm. oh, like the tax scheme was being reevaluated. I don't know. It was maybe the Paul Ryan moment with like a kind of new contract with America kind of thing. So there's a new tax scheme. And, and I was like, how can you possibly make the history of taxation interesting? Like it doesn't even belong in the New Yorker. Like, how can that be? I don't, I don't get that. But I was like, I actually kind of do want to know. I don't know anything about the history of taxation. I ended up starting the essay with the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. Mm -hmm. Because the earthquake revealed in a purely physical sense, but also in a figurative sense, the instability of the banking system. Because when the banks fell to rubble, mm -hmm. there was no money to rebuild the city. There was no federal infrastructure. There was no federal reserve bank. And it set off a chain of events, earthquake-like, that led to the Federal Reserve being founded and led to the 16th Amendment and the constitutionalization of con congressional power to, to tax income. And you could kind of tell the story from there, but at least you could start, start with an earthquake and figure people might read it. The thing someone once told me, it wasn't my editor. Have you heard of the strap hanger test? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have, but why don't you explain it okay. for folks who are not on subways? Like yeah. Like so I, I gather this is the classic New York magazine world rule that as you're writing, you should picture your reader on the subway. This is before smartphones. And so your reader has a copy of the magazine with your article in it. And the subway is packed, standing room only, and it's hot and it's sweaty and people are miserable and grumpy. And it's a lurching old subway car. And so your reader has one hand holding onto a standing up, has one hand holding onto the subway strap and the other hand holding onto the magazine. And the distance between Every word, that little kerned space should be strong enough that if the word, if the gap between the and gorilla was a page break, that your reader would be unable to resist letting go of the strap in order to turn the page at the risk of being assaultively thrown and jumbled into the next sweaty person that they're already crammed into. So that for every single word, as you choose the next word, does this word pass the strap hanger test? Would someone let go of the subway strap in order to get to this next word? I think about that all the time. I find it extremely useful. It's like too high of a bar, obviously, <laughs> especially with the history of taxation. But it's a really, it's a good reminder that it is your obligation to hold the reader's attention and and not just their kind of passive casual attention but their sort of enraptured engrossment you've talked about this sort of across the board but we're living in this moment right where acceleration everything's faster production's faster communications are faster everything's faster right and yet historians are trying to figure out how to sort of wrap a narrative around and if I just think about my own lifetime, right, the changes I've seen in my lifetime, especially in the last sort of 15, 20 years where you're like, wait a minute, that's kind of great. Like there are some good things that have come out of the Internet being the Internet. And then there are moments where I'm just like, wait a minute, slow down, slow down. We don't even know how to we don't even have the language to talk about this. We don't even know what the consequences could look like. Like we really are in a place in our society where we're not thinking about consequences very much. It's kind of like what, like the algorithm is sort of keeping us in very much in the present day. Right. And yet here you are saying, well, I'm going to take this moment and yeah, you're going to write about taxation using the earthquake, which I've read that piece. It's really great. And I think that's the only way to do it because I can guarantee you that if someone had handed me an article that opens in an expected way, then I likely would not have made it through. I likely mm -hmm. might have just said, oh yeah, I should come back to that at some point and read it and mm -hmm. not read it at all. I mean, it sounds like you constantly surprise yourself as you're working though, because you're just letting the facts. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, you. because my ignorance is so wide and so, mm -hmm. so deep that you know, anything I'm asked to write about, I really probably don't know that much about it. And if I do know a lot about it, I'm I'm less likely to actually do the assignment because it's not going to be interesting enough. You know, having that store of memories that history can be if done well, 
is a really tremendous form of solace, not because this moment in time is particularly good, but because most problems are genuinely not new. And you know when you're dating someone and then you meet their family and yes. suddenly you understand the person that you're dating in a deep, deep way that you didn't really get before. And you're like, oh yeah, that's that's why she's that way. <laughs> like I see that now. And that's gonna be, I don't think she's gonna change about that. Or, you know, he's he's that is kind of built into him <laughs> because his mother is like that, and his father is like, you know, like you just feel oriented and yeah. then you know what you're dealing with. And maybe it's it's surely richer and you might be happier about it you might be less happy about it but it is just that sense of okay now i kind of get where i am at that i feel when i investigate the history of a problem mm -hmm. and then i still don't know what to do about it but at least i feel that i know something about it and then I have a, I have, it's three dimensional to me. I'm mm -hmm. not, I'm not stuck in it like flat Stanley, like slapped to a wall with it. Like I, I can kind of walk down the hall with it and look at it and look away from it and then step ahead of it and turn around and look back at it. And I can, you know, walk behind it and, and I, I like, I kind of can see it. So I remember when um, the pandemic first started, you know, everyone was sort of hot off the presses. Like, what could we get people to write about that would be, you know, people would read that would be useful. And my editor sent me a box of books of uh, novels about plagues. Yeah. <laughs> and I was just like, I remember I was, I was stuck inside and the box came and I was so happy. Like I have this whole box you know, there's Camus, there's Defoe, there's Mary Shelley, there's, there's Steinbeck, there's Poe, uh, Saramago, there's Octavia Butler. Like, there's just all these brilliant, beautiful writers, thinkers have struggled with the problem of plagues that could end humankind or destroy the world that they know and love. And I have it all in front of me to just sit and I read just Havidly, I could not put any of it down. It was all full of wisdom and peril and hope and sorrow and betrayal and discovery. This is what art is, you know. This is this is other humans trying to understand and share their sense of what it is to be human with this little magical box of press tree pulp like that's the coolest thing like who's waiting for aliens or ai like this is the best thing humans ever came up with like this is it right here so like for me then to not be sitting at home watching the remember the curve like every day you would check the curve when is the curve gonna flatten or just these things that go outside clanging the pots and pans at 7 p.m. Like this, that filled you with helplessness. On, mm -hmm. Like there was a ritual to it. And I don't know, I'm not like blaming anybody. Like, thank you for clanging the pots and thank you for publishing the Flatten the Curve updates. But thank you for writing the Journal of a Plague Year, Daniel Defoe, because that actually helped me to think about what the terror is what is it that we are afraid of in other human beings and when we find them to be contagions what do we do with that <laughs> i don't know i feel like every assignment is like that you know like i'm struggling with this thing it's really hard to think about but look hey here's a box that came from the new yorker it's like a bunch of books and you know your job you we will actually pay you to read these books and write something Nothing in my life has ever been more unexpected or more magical than that. Which brings me to my favorite essay in the book, which is just the facts, ma'am, because you're playing with sort of the intersection of history and fiction, which is essentially what you just described. But I do love it when you're sort of challenging history and saying, well, it, it doesn't do all of the things that fiction can do. It doesn't tell us the emotional truths. It doesn't get us to the nut of the thing. It doesn't tell us the stories of sort of 
average people, right? Like it's really hard to write about average people. There's no record. You're you're left building stories out of historical record because you have primary sources that someone left behind and not a lot of women got to leave their stories behind, right? Like Jane Franklin was rare. She left a trail. And I just, do you still wrestle with that idea though, what we can do with history and what we can do with fiction? I know you've co-written a novel, but I mean, it seems like the essay really is a form that you love and you can, you can investigate whatever you want with the form, right? There are no real limits to an essay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the the Just the Facts essay, I love too. So they, <laughs> I once compiled a, a book of essays that was going to be called Just the Facts. And then I was like, ah, oh, I shouldn't publish this. But like that, I felt like was this huge, big intervention that I've been trying to make as a historian. Mm-hmm. That's not not by no means alone, right? Like there's right, been yeah. a lot of feminist critique of uh, of subjectivity and of social history and its limits. But what I was trying to explain there is that modern historical writing with its culture of empiricism, which involves the denouncing and disavowal of humor, pleasure, passion, pain, sympathy, empathy, desire, fury, really to a large degree the personal was a reaction against the emerging form of the novel in the 18th century, which was all of those things. It was the personal, passionate, furious, loving, arduous, exhausting chronicle of the private lives of ordinary people. And that divide it has all kinds of lasting consequences for us today, not least in like the just totally annoying, completely crude and unproductive history wars of a kind of con- contemporary cultural moment. But, you know, that's just a kind of a weird rehash of that that debate. But it is still the case. I mean, and this is a kind of publishing piece. Radcliffe did a pretty interesting study some years ago about um, gender in the publishing industry. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's really tough to see in in history that for the longest time, you know, all of the so-called big books, the ones you knew were going to get play in the marketplace, where, you know, David McCullough writes about John Adams. And, you know, God bless, like, mm-hmm. nice book. It's not the book that historians would ever consult. I mean, I think it's fundamentally wrong about John Adams, but, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, it's fine. <laughs> but like this sort of Father's Day History Club book, that's going to be 700 pages and going to have an initial print run of 200,000 and going to sell in the millions and is going to be blurbed by Joseph Ellis and John Meacham and, you know, the, all the, the other lovely gentlemen in that club is not a chronicle of the American past. That's why my friend Jane Kaminsky and I ended up trying to write this novel because we thought, well, the, the, it's tricky trying to write about ordinary people when you can only write about them in the aggregate, you know, infant mortality rates and life expectancy of men and women, and you know about um, enslaved people in the aggregate, you know, you know about uh, the rate of fatality on the voyage or in the first months, and you know about the sex ratio, and like, how is that ever going to compete with the cinematic, you know, Paul Giamatti wins an Emmy for playing John Adams, like that, because he's a character. John Adams, I mean, (laughs) if you read his diaries, he is completely fascinating. Like the guy is just obsessed with himself and his power in the world and his la- his sense of his lack of it. He's a completely great character. Like you can't, you you can s- scramble. And, you know, yes, you could come across Mary Shelley's diary, but for a lot of people, it's just, it's just never going to be there. And that's what the novel was for. That's what the novel was invented to do. And then to have the novel, that sort of novel denigrated as genre fiction, right? Like we call that now romance or what, you know, whereas the literary fiction is going to be the Jonathans and that's going to be, I'm sorry, I don't making enemies of all these writers whose work I totally respect, but just like, where does that work get done? And I, I, you know, so much of what I think for people who don't read a lot of history, the 1619 project was, was it was like their generations, Howard's ends, people's mm-hmm. history. Yeah. And for all that both of those projects are, and neither of them is an academic account of the past either, right? That's 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 accountable in the same ways. 
So, you know, well, that's why I wrote this, the, the, the essay that's in the book about Jane Franklin explains why I wrote that book in terms mm-hmm. of personal reasons, but the professional reasons I wrote it had to do with, okay, I could use the story of Jane Franklin, Benjamin Franklin's rags to rags sister and her life of, you know, kind of considerable loss. She had 12 children and lost 11 of them and lived really in poverty her whole life um, as an allegory for the story of how the other half lives, which was a poor Richard proverb. And in (laughs) one of my more, I don't know, just, I was rocked by this. I thought this was the most ambitious thing I'd ever written. Like totally clearly to me, this was an indictment of the whole historical profession. It was an indictment of the publishing industry. Mm -hmm. It was this, you know, whole kind of re-examination of what the founding of the United States was about with the limits of constitutional argument. Like it had all these big implications at the level of the discipline, at the level of uh, our attention as consumers of historical heritage, whatever. And the book was totally packaged and received as, oh, some girl wrote a book about some girl. Like it was like, oh, this is like, you know, Cleopatra's daughter or Galileo's sister or I don't know, Copernicus's mother-in-law. Like this was just another book like some girl wrote about like the girl. And Like as if Virginia Woolf never wrote about Shakespeare's sister or there had never been a tradition of attempting to do this kind of storytelling for the sake of expanding our notion of what lives command literary attention. It really drove me nuts, really completely took me by surprise. It was like the most twee, oh, it's like a Holly Hobby doll. Like the first jacket I got for that book was literally like a ye olde colonial silhouette of, mm. of, a, of a granny on a rocker. Mm. <laughs> it's like, mm. you got to be kidding me. I really was trying to write this badass, like burn it all down indictment of the historical profession and the cult of the founding fathers. And it's like going to be on the girl table with the, I don't know. I just, just, like with the Holly Hobby dolls? Yeah, I get it. No, no, I totally get it. And part of it for me, too, is like it goes back to who gets to tell stories, right? Who's who's the historical record? And what do we do with that information, right? Like we're still interpreting what people and there have been some wild moments recently where people have <clears throat> misinterpreted, you know, law, history, other sort of things and still decided that they were in the right and it's kind of wild to see and everything now i don't want to say everything's open to interpretation but i'd really like us to look at what we consider canon and how we mark things yeah. as canon and yeah that's partially history but that's also partially who we are now mm-hmm. and the two do need to meet like you were just talking about popular history versus sort of you know academia and you know can we have both i just feel like There are people who hold on to the pop history in a way where they're just like, well, academia doesn't matter. And certainly there are academics who are like, I can't with the pop history. And I'm kind of thinking, but isn't it good to have all of the things that could bring someone to a different place? And I mean, that's how I feel about these truths, like the way you handle a lot of the material in these truths where you're like, listen, we're hypocrites. We're straight up hypocrites. There's a lot of good things that we do. And there's this shared sense of purpose that we need to have, but we're also hypocrites and we have to talk about genocide and we have to talk about all of the ugly bits, right? Mm -hmm. Slavery, Mm -hmm. all of it. If you think about how emotionally caught up people get, right? When they're talking about history and interpretations of history, it doesn't Mm -hmm. matter what your perspective, all I'm saying is everyone has a point of view and some people get really wound up when they're talking about. Yeah. And essentially what we're all trying to do is say, well, can't we just get all of the pieces right? Like, I'm not saying that other things don't matter entirely. I'm just saying I would like my seat at the table, please. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing where I'm like, we're not there yet, man. We're still having the same conversations we've been having over and over and over again about history and citizenship and all of these things where I'm like, oh, we're still here. Yeah. And that it is frustrating because the kind of scholarship that's been done over the mm-hmm. last 50, 60 years, you know, Chicano history, Asian American history, mm-hmm. disability history, right? history of the conservative movement, 
history of science, really interesting work in history of law. You know, obviously, like Black history has just you know exploded since really since the late 1950s, mm-hmm. and that work hasn't always successfully made it out of the academy. Right. And so a lot of the academics are mad at popular history is really a proxy for that, right? Mm -hmm. Popular history tends to have not, you know, has really just not done a good job. It's it's marketed to a certain kind of audience that wants Mm -hmm. a certain kind of whitewashed, or maybe they don't want it, honestly, but that's what's being marketed to them. I think there's a lot of fearfulness because now the other thing like it's publishing i don't mean to be indicting publishers but like you know i it's not the case that either american history is a story of the march march of progress and freedom from the beginning to now or that the story of american history is a a litany of atrocity you know like both of those things are true and neither of those things are true and that's Mm -hmm. that that's that's just maybe more complicated to market and it's harder to market to a segment of the population like but but why shouldn't everybody be reading you know this breaking new book about chinese exclusion like that would be great like that'd be a really helpful book to have like the, everybody should be reading everybody should be reading that it should be being pushed out to that like father's day group of people that once read john adams like why not i don't understand like that that piece of um the caution and tentativeness of of, of publishing is tough to see where it has a consequences that are somewhat new and will be nevertheless abiding, it has to do with Supreme, the Supreme Court's turn to a particular kind of originalism and, mm-hmm. and also sometimes called traditionalism. Mm-hmm. So if you think about the big cases in the last two years, the overturning of Roe v. Wade, the Bruin case, which is a, a, a gun rights case, mm-hmm. um, and the affirmative action case, they're relying on a, a model of jurisprudence that says, well, we can't do anything. We have to, we have to overturn Roe. We have to make uh gun laws unconstitutional, declare them unconstitutional. We have to declare affirmative act non- unconstitutional because we are all we can really do is look to the historical record. And and, yeah. and, and if we can't find a precedent that looks to it's not exactly precedent, like a tradition that differs from this. And that's how that's how we're going to be proceeding. And, you know, for most of American history, women and people of color just could not vote, couldn't run for office, couldn't vote, couldn't really express political opinions in a way that would ever reach elected officials or could ever possibly be conceived to have an influence on them. And yet now everyone is being asked to abide by a historical tradition as the American historical tradition that is really just judges reading the worst possible historical and most, you know, frustratingly narrow account of the American past. So when you say the canon, absolutely, like in a literary sense, we in in an in in a scholarly sense, we need to have a much bigger understanding of that, of that past. But in a very urgent constitutional sense, we desperately need that. And I'm hoping we can do it sooner rather than later, because when you say urgent, yeah, that's the word we want. That is in fact the word we want. But on that note too, can I ask what you're working on next? Yeah, I will. I'm on leave this year. So I have a thousand projects that I'm um, still playing with, but I am for sure trying to finish a book that I've been researching for years, which is trying to shake up that notion of our constitutional history by looking at all the ways that people had have tried to amend the U.S. Constitution. Mm-hmm. And the premise of the book, this is not, it's not a policy argument, but the right. impetus for the book is just to say, if we're going to be making judicial decisions about, you know, whether a six-year-old can bring an AK-15, AR-15 to kindergarten based on a historical tradition that, that says there's nothing that says you can't do that, we, we need to have a much richer understanding of, of what what America's constitutional tradition is. And that's going to involve looking at the demands of people who had really no political voice whatsoever. And and the book sort of attempts to try to constitutionalize them. Mm -hmm. So an example that I often give when the delegates of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787 were getting ready to begin their sessions, they, they, they had made a decision that the sessions would be secret. And they would have to take a vow of secrecy for 50 years. And it's like a, a, a sequestered jury. They weren't allowed to 
read the newspaper, send messages, you know, get mail, send mail. The last letter that Benjamin Franklin received before the sequester uh, was from his sister. And she wrote to him from Boston and she's just, just her usual, like, totally fake flattery. Like, oh, you men are so wise. Thank you for writing a whole new system of laws for all of us. Like, thank you. You're so brilliant. By the way, I hope you'll beat the swords into plowshares. Like this kind of call for peaceability. Yep. Um, a plea for nonviolence. I mean, she's very religious. Like it is just a biblical refrain. Mm-hmm. But if we were creative originalists, I don't know, that could be part of our canon for how we think about whether the Second Amendment was could actually ratified by women. Can it be said to have been ratified in any meaningful right. way when... I think if we looked at a lot of other correspondence, we might find many similar expressions of concern about, you know, she was a woman who lived through the siege of Boston. A lot of women were raped mm-hmm. by British soldiers um, during that siege. A lot of people were beaten up by soldiers with bayonet, bayonets. There, she was in Boston during the Boston Massacre when shots were fired and five innocent people were just killed. So she had views about guns and militias, and they're not in the Constitution. So um, should women just not have to abide by that like do, do, is it not our constitution like how do we make it a constitution that works for everybody that's the premise of the project we'll see it's i will say this it is full of surprises yeah but that's part of the fun of reading you i mean that's you get in to the material in a way that there really is something for everyone when you're writing and i just i can't stress that enough that you're just not you're Jill Lepore just telling a story. That's really what I get when I'm reading you. And I will ask, though, can we have the Dickens book at some point? Because, I mean... The Dickens book, it just haunts me. Copyright is a thing where I'm just like, I would really like someone to write that book. I think we're just not having enough conversation. I, there are other stuff that is slightly more urgent, but I do think the Dickens copyright book. Could. Yeah, yeah. I have a giant wall-sized map of the United States in the year that he toured with all of his stops and all of the dates. And I look at it every day and kind of just slap myself for having ditched it. I I loved that project. Maybe there'll be time one day. Yeah. Time one day is is kind of it. But do you think you're just going to keep sort of alternating between essay collections and larger narrative works? I don't know. I don't know. I, I Essays are definitely more fun for me than books. I get very, very restless. I love, I love writing an essay. I love the intensity and the f- sort of fury of it all. And then I love that it's over and I, I never have to really think about that subject again. And a book, <laughs> I once said this at a talk and my husband was like, I can't believe you said that. But it is true. I sometimes think like, you know, a book is a marriage, but an essay is just an affair. Like it just, <laughs> Do you just like I have no knowledge of these things other than like soap operas, but that's how I think about it. like you're when you're in a book, like you you're in it. You're really you're really in it, and it will never go away. People will ask people still ask me about my first book that I wrote when I was basically like a brainstem, and I don't remember a thing about it. I don't I really know nothing about King Philip's War, which is the subject of my first book. But essays, yeah, they just sort of they vanish they vanish behind you, and I I kind of love that. And that seems like a really good place to wrap this interview. (laughs) Jill Lepore, thank you so much. The deadline's out now. There's a lot of backlist. So if you haven't read the other stuff, go back and check that too. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.